Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Variations on an Exoplanet theme. Uh, first of all, my thanks to Andy Wilson for looking after the technical matters and being the person to blame if it all goes wrong, and Rodney Buckland for giving a lot of help with the organisation of this meeting, and of course the speakers and the attendees. Uh, if at the end of the day anyone feels they can implement or help with any particular project, project then please contact me. Right. Once upon a time, there were just transits, but there is so much more to be learned from them, hence, hence the title. This is today's agenda. Um, it's changed quite a bit over the weeks. The speakers have come and gone. So if you've printed something down from the website, it's probably way out of date. So we start with me, um, then Rodney Buckland, uh, analysis of exoplanet TTVs uh, by Heidi, uh, stellar variability by Professor Don Polarco, computational modeling by Jack Lloyd Walters. Oh, a break in there and then the lunch break and analysis of periodic variations and exoplanet observations by Stephen Mills, and then determining in the potential habitability of transited exoplanets by Emily, and then Rodney and myself closing the meeting. So some admin. Uh, I'd like speakers to introduce themselves at the start of the talks. It's less complicated than me doing it, and I'll probably get it wrong anyway. Uh, Questions may be asked using the Q&A facility. Uh, presentations will be recorded and put on the BAA YouTube channel. And um, if you could let me have a PDF of your talk, which will also be placed on the BAA Explanet website somewhere. Uh, if you don't want either of those to happen, then, then let Andy or, or myself know. Right, contents of this meeting. Um, uh, an introduction to exoplanet transits, um, because there may be some people, hopefully, who are new to this subject and perhaps don't understand it as much as some. And then we'll move into the myriad ways of transit can vary in time, duration, and depth. Uh, some of the terminology is well known; uh, others I have invented for the for this meeting. I also mentioned some of, some of the observatories making these observations. Seems seems almost every observatory in the world is observing exoplanets at the moment. Right, exoplanet transits, uh, what are they? Single planets, multi-planets, observations are the same, and what can they tell us about the orbits of the planets and the planets themselves? Uh, some definitions, uh, the passage of a planet in front of its host star can be referred to as a transit or primary eclipse, although transit is more common. And the passage of that planet behind the star is referred to as an eclipse or secondary eclipse. Right. When a planet passes directly between a star and its observer, it dims the light by a measurable amount. If you've got a good telescope and a good camera, that is. Larger planets, planets as you might expect, block more light. And this animation shows the difference in sizes and shows the changes in the light curve. So you can see the larger planet blocks out more light for a for a longer time. Light curves get complicated when more planets are transiting a star. Combined light curves can give us the same information as a single one. It just takes much more work to pick out each planet in the data. When the second and third planets transit together, the light curve becomes a combination of two separate transits deepens when both planets are transiting. If the two of the planets are in a mean motion resonance, that is the orbits are a simple integer ratio of each other, the larger can influence the orbit of the smaller by changing its eccentricity or period or inclination, and this can lead to changes in transit timing. Uh, these are exam example observations using the free micro-observatory telescopes based in Arizona. They're only six-inch telescopes, but you can get reasonable transits from them. Uh, a plot from the Exoplanet Transit database is on the left, and the Exoclock database on the right. Uh, Exoclock no longer accepts observations from public observatories such as this, as it was felt to be confusing if the same data was input by different observers. 
you can still put your input to the exoplanet transit database, the one on the, on the left. Uh, this slide shows a binary star system, stars one and two. An S-type system is where the planets orbit the individual stars. The P-type system is one where the planet orbits the binary pair, a circumbinary planet, an example of which is shown on the next slide. This is a transiting circumbinary planet in a P-type system known as PH1b, orbiting the star KIC 4862625, which is an eclipse in binary in a 20-day orbit. The planet was actually discovered by volunteers participating in the Planet Hunter Citizen Science Project. Transits of the planet across the larger and brighter the eclipsing stars occur every uh, 37 days. It's slightly confusing because the terms primary and secondary eclipse refer to the binary system and, and not the planet. And that's the planet transit there. That's the primary eclipse and the secondary eclipse of the, of the system. The presence of planets may cause variations in eclipse timings of the binary star system. These are some of the, the key terms used. Uh, we have midtime, we have depth, and we have duration. So what can they tell us? Uh, determining the period between successive transits will define the orbital period of the exoplanet. That's the green path. Knowing the mass and diameter of the host star gives us the planet's semi-major axis. That's the yellow and the green path. And the magnitude drop in and out of transit from which the related flux ratio can be calculated, combined with knowledge of the host star's diameter, Will enable the planet's diameter to be calculated. That's the yellow and red path. So you can learn quite a lot from a transit. Moving on to the intricacies of transit variations as some of the observatories involved. The video shows how transit times vary when a second planet is introduced into the system. A single planet with a nominal mid-transit time indicated when the timer shows 12 o'clock on the right. And then we move into a two planet system with the additional planet in a wider orbit. The mid transit time, early or later, of the original planet varies according to the relative positions of the two planets. Actually, the portion of the planet illuminated by the star can be clearly seen. Uh, and this is relevant to the phase curve slide, which is the next but one. Equivalent to the phases of our moon, I guess. The effects of an additional planet. This is an actual example. Transit timings of KOI H72b are shown on the left, which led to the discovery of KOI H72c, a non-transiting planet. So phase curve variations. Um, the left image is a transiting exoplanet with the primary and the secondary eclipse or the transit, if you like. The right image shows a non-transiting exoplanet uh, due to the inclination of the orbit with respect to our line of sight. So it doesn't actually pass in front of the host star. On the left image, we see a variation due to the reflected starlight. That's, that's this line. On the right image, we also see a variation, which is labeled composite phase curve, even though there isn't actually a transit. So you get a maximum brightness at superior conjunction and a minimum brightness at inferior conjunction. A paper follow-up of non-transiting planets detected by Kepler describes how the authors searched the Kepler database for such variations. And uh, discovered three hot Jupiters and possibly three more. So there's two possible projects for us. That's detecting secondary transits 
and detect an exoplanet's use and phase curve variations, something we might be able to do. Another example of TTVs leading to its discovery. The very first detection of a non-trusting planet using transit timing variations was carried out with NASA Space Telescope. The transiting planet 19b showed transit timing variations with an amplitude of five minutes in a period of about 300 days, indicating the presence of a second planet, Kepler 10c, 19c, I should say, which has a period that is in near three to one resonance with Kepler b. D was discovered by the radial velocity method, method that's measuring the wobble of the host star due to gravitational interaction between the star and the planet. Uh, Kepler and its revised mission K2 uh, run for nine years, from 2009 to 2018. Awful lot of data there to be analyzed. <clears throat> Transit timing variations can be used to measure the mass of the exoplanets in compact multiple planet systems, such as TRAPPIST-1. Uh, this slide compares the TRAPPIST-1 system with the inner solar system. TRAPPIST-1, TRAPPIST actually stands for Transiting Planets and Planetesimals Small Telescope South. Uh, it's a 60 centimeter telescope at La Silla and is devoted entirely to the study of planetary systems. As I said earlier, a lot of telescopes do uh, I use for exoplanet work, but not necessarily full time. TTVs can also be used to measure the masses of planets that are in 246912 resonant chains. The system TOI178 is an example of this. Uh, for those new to this, TOI stands for TESS Object of Interest, TESS being the Transit and Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Lots of acronyms. There you go. And it will survey 200,000 of the brightest stars near the sun to search for trans and exoplanets. And it's been up there about five years now. Uh, orbital decay. The vertical axis shows the change in transit times, negative indicating that transit times are earlier than predicted. The change is approximately eight minutes over 10 years. An alternative reason for the apparent change in the orbital period is precession of an eccentric orbit, as I will show uh, in after the next slide. Um, another paper actually concludes the orbit of WASP-12b is eccentric. Uh, you see here, you get a, a minus there, goes positive and comes back minus again. So there's two reasons really for that, that change in, in, uh, in transit times. This orbit is precessing, is an example of a precessing orbit clockwise. And the planet is a, sorry, the planet is, get this right now, that <laughs> it's precessing anti-clockwise that way. And the planet is in a clockwise orbit. The sequence starts with the planet is furthest from the host star, Apastron. The open circle shows where the planet would be if the orbit was circular, and transits always occurred at fixed time intervals. You can see in the top row, as the orbit precesses, the planet arrives later and later to our line of sight. And you see in the bottom row, as the planet, as the orbit precesses, the planet arrives, uh, the transits become later as a, sorry, get a bit mixed up here with my uh, slide. I they need to, need to go down a little. The bottom row, right, done the top row. The planet transits earlier than expected, but less earlier as the orbit uh, processes. The orbit may also experience changes in its shape, more to less elliptical. So you can get changes in transit times due to precessing orbits. Secular resonance refers to the situation when precession or changes in orientation with time are synchronized between the orbits of two planets. Cosi resonance occurs when the eccentricity and inclination of an orbit oscillate with time. One increases as the other decreases and vice versa. So this is, this is one I made up for Rodney queried this. Transit impact parameter variations. Uh, nodal precession is when the ascending and descending nodes 
precessors shown here. Hot Jupiter planets are in tight orbits around the host star, and since that star will not necessarily be perfectly spherical, small gravitational perturbations will cause the orbit to precess. When the Earth exoplanet host star lined up as shown, we would see the lower transit there. The effect of precession of the nodes would cause the orbit to move as shown by the short dotted line. And the transit would then occur as shown by the upper line across the host star. The impact parameter term uh, varies from when from zero when the transit is across the center of the star to one when the transit crosses the edge of the disk. The transit duration thus varies with the impact parameter. It will be longer at the center and shorter at the edge of the disk. So another reason for transit timing variations. So another one I made up, TSVs, transit shape variations. Light curve for comets is very different than the usual U shape associated with exoplanet transits as shown in this diagram. The predicted light curve uh, is on the right and the test observation is actually on the left. And you can see how that differs from what, what, a, what I would call a, a normal transit, much more V-shaped and this is much more U-shaped. Uh, Exotrojans may actually come into the, into the picture. The position of Trojans uh, ahead and behind the star, the planet, I should say, are shown in the diagram on the left. The ALMA image shows the planet and another and another object, which could be a Trojan, uh, a clump of matter condensing into a planet or planetary debris. Oscillations or libration of Trojans around the L4 and L5 points, which they do, may cause transit timing variations. Uh, possible exomoons. Observations with the Hubble and Kepler space telescopes have uncovered evidence of what could be an exomoon. That's a moon orbiting a planet outside our solar system. You see the deeper transit of the planet followed by the shallow transit of the moon. The moon hypothesis is tentative and needs to be confirmed. Excuse me. By follow up observations. <coughs> Voices running out. Uh, this is a light curve of two transits with a leading solid line and a trailing moon, that's the dash line. Considering where the case where the moon is leading the planet, we get a, that's the solid line. So you get the moon only, which is a shallow transit, and then you get the moon and the planet, which is a deeper transit, and you get the planet only, which is slightly less transit, and that's the end of transit. So we're talking about the solid line for a leading moon. If we have a trailing moon, that's the dashed line. Prior, you get prior to transit there, and you get the planet only, which is a deep transit, and then the moon and the planet, which is an even deeper transit, and then you get the moon only, which is a shallow transit. So changes in the shape of the transit can indicate whether or not there's a moon. Uh, this is an actual example. Uh, you get a short drop there, which is the moon, and you get a deeper drop there, which is the moon and, and the planet. And the right diagram, the moon is trailing the planet. So you just get a slight dip there and you get a slightly deeper transit there compared with where you've got the planet only, and that's the moon and the planet. So you can get variations in depth. Um, planet appears to have a larger radius shown by the deeper transit when it is in the red compared with the blue. The star is not the same brightness across the diameter of this disk, and this is known as limb darkening. The image of the sun and the light curve, our sun and the light curve below show this effect. Imaging at shorter wavelengths leads to stronger limb darkening, and to quote from the website from which I obtained the data, a curvy bottom. Measurements of the transit of multiple wavelengths allow the amount of limb darkening to be defined 
and this is subsequently used to accurately determine the radius of a transiting any transiting action planet. Very important is Lynn Dartney. So Coro was a convection rotation and planetary transits observatory. Uh, it's the first mission capable of detecting rocky Earth-like planets. And it was a 30 centimeter space telescope, which uh, was operational from 2006 to 2014. So stellar variability, which Don will tell us all about. You can get incorrect measurement of planetary radius because star spots reduce the effective stellar disk area, leading to an underestimation of the stellar radius and a larger transit depth, suggesting a larger planet. Or you can actually get false detections as the star spots rotate with a star. But as they go relatively slowly compared with a transit exoplanet, um, they should be relatively easy to detect. Uh, the right-hand diagram shows capital 3C. The portion of the curve uh, is shown in the bottom panel. The black line is a transit as it would be without the star spots, and the red line is a transit with one star spot. Um, I showed this diagram earlier and noticed there was a blip in the light curve there, so maybe we've got an actual star spot in, in, that, in that light curve. So this is where it all started for us. Uh, back in the day, just before COVID struck, we had a presentation on the ExoClock project at an asteroid and remote planet section meeting in Clanfield. Uh, this was actually in the nature of a pre-announcement as it hadn't yet been revealed to the rest of the astronomical world. And this project was a main driver which really got our exoplanet division underway. And we still make a lot of contributions to it. Uh, The exoplanet transit data will help to ensure that the aerial spacecraft is pointing at the right star at the right time, because some of the exoplanets have not been observed for, for some considerable time, maybe up to 10 years. And so we will launch in 2029 20, as it stands at the moment. If you want to try a hand, um, some transits from the exoplanet database are listed here and identified on the database as having TTVs next to the planet name. In the example shown, the vertical axis is the observed time minus the calculated time, and the transit time variations are fairly obvious, as you can see here. So, finally, an unfinished symphony of variations and systems. I've given you a glimpse of the multitude of variations I will leave it to the far more cleverer people following to explain the various mechanisms and how they can be detected and analyzed. So you'll be glad to know that's my presentation finished. If I stop sharing. Right. Thank you, Roger. Do we so have if... uh, any questions or is anybody still there? Comment from Siegfried who says exomoon effects can be modelled by the Python package Pandora by Michael Hipke. Right. Thank you, Siegfried, for that.